Thank Welcome you. into Coil's Adventures interview with Tris Imboden. Uh, and let's get into it. You were born, you were a native Californian, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, both my parents were. I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, oh. only in route because my mom was flying to Germany to meet my dad, who was stationed there in Heidelberg, Germany uh, in 1951. So, uh, so yeah, but other than that, my whole family are native Californians and I consider myself one. Yeah. And you grew up, uh, in Newport, uh, Newport beach, you went to Newport Harbor high. I did. Yeah. Actually my family moved a few times, but I was in Orange County for, for, uh, mo most all of my, my okay. youth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so the other honk guys are like Laguna Beach. How do you guys connect? Initially? Well, um, they the other guys, uh, the majority of the guys in honk all went to Newport Harbor High School, too. Really? Although I was the youngest member and uh, I didn't know them when I was uh, at Newport Harbor High School. I started I transferred from Marina High School my junior year and uh, they had already graduated. But uh, they saw me play, actually, with a band uh, called the Yesco Train. That was a band in, in, uh, at, from Newport Harbor High School. And, uh, and I knew of them because they were sort of local heroes, some of the guys that Honk hadn't formed yet. Right. But there was one called New Life that had a record deal and... Uh, actually a record out and all of that. And and uh, I'd seen the bass player Don Whaley perform on TV with the Cinderman years before wow. that. He, he was in the Cinderman, the, the band that actually was playing at the Rendezvous Ballroom when it burnt to the ground. Oh, wow. Isn't that ironic, the name Cinderman? And... Yeah. <laughs> you were in a band before that called The Other Half. What was that about? Well, yeah, that was a, a really good band from Marina High School. Uh, we were all uh, attending Marina High School, and it was just a bunch of guys that sang well and and played well, and we we formed and at our peak, we actually uh, they banned us from playing at the Teenage Fair in Hollywood because we were playing at the Standell booth, which was right as you walked into the Teenage Fair, and the band was good, and we blocked like the whole like entrance so nobody could get through because people wanted to see the band and so anyway that was our claim to fame was that uh, here at the palladium yeah at the palladium yeah yeah yeah, Very cool. Back <laughs> yeah. In the States. um so when you got into honk it was don whaley and uh steve wood and beth for before she was beth for wood and Rick, richard steckel and was that it well, actually, when the band first formed, it was a quartet. Okay. And we, there was a different guitarist. Uh, Mike Carousel, rest his soul, he's passed now, uh, was the guitarist. Uh, and Don Whaley on bass, Steve Wood, and myself. Oh. And uh, <clears throat> Mike Carousel was kind of a blues purist. And he uh, actually, he left the band. He tried to take me with him and <laughs> saying that, I don't want to play this, pardon the expression, pussy music anymore. And uh, and then, little known fact, he was asked to join the Eagles because the Eagles were forming right about that time. Wow. And uh, he, he uh, declined. And I said, you know what, Michael, you ought to rent yourself out to bands that are just forming and then quit because they all go on to do pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he had a good sense of humor. He he laughed. Good yeah. camp, uh, compass, more. Yeah. Um, when I first saw you guys, you were in the football field at Newport Harbor. Uh, uh, Five Summer Stories had already come out and was a, a big hit, which is why I went to see you guys yeah. there. And the pipeline sequence back and forth. Yeah. But what I loved off of that album was this song. And your drum work on it. Which song? I can't hear it. 
I'm not hearing it, Rick. Let me see if I can. It's very soft right now. Starting with Steve's piano. Yeah, mm -hmm. know. I'm just hearing for a second, and then it's it's gone. Darn it! It's it's low pass. Oh, okay. Ah, uh, yeah. You're you're oh, trying right. fascinated me. The the off timing and it, it was so subtle, and yet it was just like that's coming from this surf band. This is here. It is. Oh, I can hear it now. Yeah. Oh man. I just, I just have always loved your drum part on that. Oh, Rick, thank you. Thank you so much, man. Uh, Tell me about it. I'll well, um, actually, we we wrote the majority of that music in the studio, uh, kind of on the spot. Um, Greg McGillivray, who knew the band from Laguna, uh, and who was the director of the film and the famous, you know, filmmaker McGill at that time, McGillivray Freeman um, Films, um, was a fan of the band and approached us about doing a soundtrack for this surf film. And so we uh, we said, sure. And we weren't really a surf band at all, but but uh, we were up for it. And uh and so we wrote most of all that music in the studio and uh, pretty spontaneously. Now, and, were they showing the clips? Because this is about Gary Lopez, right? The surfer? Oh, yeah. Jerry Lopez. Yeah. Yeah. Who was Mr. Pipeline back then considered. And uh, <clears throat> no, uh, actually. And Steve, uh, they didn't show us any of the footage uh, at all. Just... Um, Greg kind of described who was surfing and where. And both Steve Wood and myself were avid surfers and grew up surfing. And so, and we're familiar kind of with the styles of those surfers and those spots uh, that they were surfing at, if only through pictures and film. Uh, not that we'd surfed all those spots at that, at that point. One of the first uh, surf films I ever saw was Bruce Brown I think in Laguna Beach Auditorium, four walling it, and he was doing the narration during the movie. Those days. right, right. That's how they used to do it, the old surf films. And and uh, Bruce Brown was actually a family friend of uh, of uh, my family, wow. uh, my uncle, um, and he <laughs> were yeah were were pals in in Naples, California, and uh, yeah, so. Uh, but yeah, boy, that was that really set the tone. Uh, Endless summer was really the the uh, gold standard for many years, and then Five Summer Stories came along too, and sort of was revolutionary yeah. uh, in a lot of that. the soundtrack and the the actual the the cinematography. Uh, a lot of that had not been uh, utilized before. Greg was kind of an innovator and. Uh, we we played uh, at the Santa Monica. I'm sorry, at the Santa Monica Civic, uh, at the opening, the premiere of that uh, of Five Summer Stories for two consecutive nights, and uh, it was funny. the The first night, nobody knew who the hell we were. They just wanted to see the movie, right? And so. <laughs> We almost got booed off stage, you know. We we're playing, uh, you know, like this artsy fartsy kind of folk music, uh, you know, or folk rock, and uh, they just wanted to see the movie, and uh, it was kind of funny. But uh, yeah, uh, that's a whole nother story I I could tell you <laughs> about. But Sticks. but anyways, uh, they ended up loving us, of course. Like once they found out we were. Uh, the ones that created the, the music for the movie. And uh, and uh, it was, it's still, it's to this day, it blows my mind just uh, how revered that soundtrack is. And uh, awesome. I thought we, yeah, we just did a show um, just at the beginning of August here. The coach uh, house. Yeah, at the coach house. Yeah. And again, it was sold out. And uh, man, you know, we opened with the blue of your backdrop and people went nuts. It was uh, 
It's really, really amazing, man, all these years later. Yeah. Well, it's good music that stands the test of time. Yeah. After that, you went into one of my favorite bands of yours, jazz. Oh, oh man. God, Rick. Mike Hamilton and yeah. uh, Karen Hammock and Karen Benson and Sammy, whose last name I can't recall. It was Sammy Allen on bass. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Brody for you at the Red Onion. Oh, Rick. God, man. I knew I knew your name and I know your face. <laughs> But the, I, I didn't the, realize the drums up the stairs, the red onion, and all that. Oh stuff. man, thank you again. <laughs> I, I remember sitting because, like you know, it was the red onion, so people were there to eat and talk. But I was sitting like right at the side of the stage, and you guys went into Fred. And oh. Fred. Now was that Mike bringing that to the band or? Well, yeah, he was a big Alan Holdsworth fan. And I, of course, was a Tony Williams fan as well. Yeah. I became a big Alan Holdsworth fan. And uh, yeah, the neat thing, as you know, uh, about in those days, and particularly that club was, and that band, we we were so eclectic. I mean, we we played such a variety of music, man. Everything from that, you know, which is jazz fusion, to to Bonnie Raitt to you know to uh, every anything and everything it was uh, it was all fair game and uh, they were all such great players that we were able to do that too but the club was it was so great uh, that they allowed us to do that too so well, it, I tell you that song your version of that song still has legs because every time I see like Karen or Mike I just say Fred <laughs> there's a uh little yeah <laughs> that's so cool i didn't know we we went that far back you and oh, i yeah and then um the three three fifths of honk are actually playing sunday at a a house party at newport it's uh Steckel and the two woods oh how great yes. i wish i could be there yeah well you'll you'll be out here yeah weekend at Spagatini with your new group, the yeah. Tris Imboden Yacht Rock All-Stars. That's a mouthful. No, it's a Tris Imboden Yacht Stars. Yacht Stars. Okay. Yeah. Yacht Rock. Good. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. And I don't know whether you know the story about that. Did Did you hear the story, how it even was conceived? Not exactly. I, I know that they're like some old, old running buddies that sort of it's like the, uh, I don't know, the lawyers and doctors putting together a band, but you guys are actually ex or still current uh, mu musicians that have semi-retired and okay. hung together. I, I've got to tell you this story. Please. I was, uh, my wife and I, Mary, right. were going to go see Ringo All-Stars. We got tickets and and I know so many of the guys in that band and have in all its incarnations. But uh, the particular year uh, that we went, um, it was Greg Bissonette and Steve Lukather. I've done a million records with Steve and Greg and I are very close friends. But also Amish Stewart, whom I knew from uh, Average White Band and, and Colin Hay, who's married to my ex-wife, Cecilia Noel. Uh, <laughs> but long story short, we knew we were going, and uh, but about a half an hour before we left to go to the venue, I get a call from Greg Bissonette, and he said, I don't want to promise anything, but there's a good chance that you might be sitting in tonight on Ringo's drums. Excellent. And I said, what? And he said, yeah. So get on YouTube and learn our arrangement of, of uh, uh, with a little help from my friends and give peace a chance because we do it in the encore. Right. <laughs> and I went, Oh my God, can this be happening? So uh, I asked Mary to drive and I was listening to you know, YouTube <laughs> all the way to the show. And sure enough, uh, I, they asked me to, to sit in. And uh, so I did. I, I, so long story, I'm trying to make it short. On on the 
on the way home, after having done that, and I, I laughingly say I haven't watched since playing Ringo's drums, you know, um, my wife kind of uh, had a brilliant idea, actually. And she, she said, you know, Tris, with all the records you've done and with all the people you know um, and all the hits that you've been a part of in the whole yacht rock genre with Loggins and with others, yeah. uh, uh, you could put something together kind of in that yacht rock vein. And I went, God, that's kind of a good idea. So I made a few phone calls. And everyone I talked to went, whoa, I'm in. I'd love to do that. So that was the birth of the Tris and Bowden Yacht Stars. But then enter COVID, right? right? And so it put a huge, like, apostrophe in the thing. Uh, <laughs> and it it was, it, we'd started rehearsals and we're only about five rehearsals in. It was sounding real good. Uh, and then COVID hit and everything shut down. So anyway, since that time, what's that? It's more rehearsal time. Yeah, right, right. Well, we tried, except we couldn't do it because, you know, we all had to, to like, isolated. like, yeah, stay isolated and shelter in place. So, and unfortunately, the technology wasn't such where we could even do vocal rehearsals because, as you probably know, uh, the delay in, in time you know, just prohibited that. So, you know, you count off. I heard song, there's a everybody, everybody called, um, acapella that like some of the guys in um, uh, media family used so they could they could do synced up stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the Zoom rehearsals too. Yeah, now yeah. There, is, there is the technology, but it only extends so many miles. Oh. And uh, yeah before the delay happens again. So anyway, but since that time, uh, I'm happy to say we've sold out a number of concerts and, and the band sounds great. And uh, the criteria is you either had to have to play on the original record of a song that we do or have worked with that artist, like performed with them live or in some capacity. But gratefully, between us, that, that casts this big net. I mean, everybody from Donald Fagan to uh, Boss Skaggs to, you know, of course, Michael McDonald and Kenny. Um, and uh, I mean, on and on, Gary Wright. It's wow. like, yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. So anyway, it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. So So we're having fun. And September 2nd, coming up the week after this airs, uh -huh. uh, it's Bagatini, and rumor has it that as of this recording, there's still a few tickets left, so some people watching this may be able to get in to see you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, it was sold out. They had it sold out on the site, and then all of a sudden, uh, they made some seats. Uh, they added some seats, so, they, uh, so now, yeah, I guess they've added 11 seats or something, and so yeah, you can, you my can see. Me. Unfortunately, but uh, a friend of mine is going to be going to see you, so she'll be. Oh, there. great! Good, good. Well, I hope she enjoys it. I'm sure she will. Um, she's a, a big honk fan, big, big uh, steckle. So you know, she's on all the shows, that kind of stuff. Oh, cool. Tell me. Well, okay, uh, right. back to like Fred days, and when you were not Fred days, um, Jasbo days. Uh -huh. You and Michael were both in the band, and at one point, you both separately auditioned for Kenny, and uh -huh. you got the job, but you didn't know it at the time. When you came back to like put in your papers with Jasbo, how did that go off? It's uh -huh. like you know we're losing two of the members of the band. How oh shoot! Well, I'd actually gone up and auditioned first. Um, and at that point, I was sort of dividing. I, I was working with an, a British artist, Ian Matthews, that I'd recorded a couple of albums with. The and something other album that he did up in Santa Barbara. I have that. Uh, no. Uh, one we had done in Nashville um, the, uh, called Go For Broke. Okay. Uh, and the other was in L.A. Um and and so no, it wasn't one up in Santa Barbara, 
but so I had kind of I was a, a, as much as I hated to to my to leave my involvement with jazz bowl. I was sort of out moving out because we were getting ready to go on the road and open for Little Feet. Oh. Ian Matthews was. Yeah. My girlfriend, and actually I had heard from Karen Hammock uh, about this incredible uh, album that she had heard. Uh, somebody, uh, I think it was a friend of ours, mutual friend, Greg Astle, had gone up and auditioned for the um, one of the, there was a hundred and some odd drummers that auditioned for Kenny. Uh, and uh, Greg was one of them. And, and uh, I guess Karen had heard um, this album, Celebrate Me Home, and and just said, oh, you can't believe it. And this bass player, my God. I mean, the music was just exquisite. It was such a great blend of like, you know, jazz influenced R&B and pop and all of that and Kenny's voice and all you you really need to to hear it. Meanwhile, my girlfriend was saying, you should go audition. And I was like, I was really ambivalent. I was going, well, yeah, except I have a gig already and we're getting ready to go on the road, you know. Uh, and Ian Matthews was a friend in addition to, you know, me just being, a, you know, a side man in his band. So um, anyway, I went up not really thinking because, as I say, there was over 100 and some odd drummers and a lot of them heroes of mine that were auditioning. I didn't think I, I had a chance. So I thought, ah, what the hell? Anyway, I went up and heard this music and and the auditions that George Hawkins, the bass player, was conducting. Uh, George and I hit it off immediately. It was just an immediate hookup. And uh, the music was so incredible. And and uh, so they kept calling me back, Rick. And I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do if I get this gig? I mean, I can't say no. I mean, career-wise, it was obvious, you know. Uh, yeah, it was going to go. It was going to take off, and uh, and that band was was getting ready to open for Fleetwood Mac on the Rumors tour. So it was like, yeah. So anyway, they lacked uh, a uh, they lacked at that point a keyboard player, a guitar player, and a drummer. Uh, they already had George Hawkins and and then the two horn players, Finn Stenham and uh, John Clark. Yeah. So um, so anyway, they kept calling me back and uh, and then they were asking me for recommendations too for after a time for guitarists and I was talking, trying to talk Mike into going up and and uh, auditioning and he did finally and and uh, man you know Mike Hamilton is just. Yeah. <laughs> like Hamilton and and man so every, they were knocked out with him and so that's how it happened and so uh jazz Bowl, I guess continued on a without it for a while yeah and to see yeah uh which I was happy to see but uh but man that was uh that was really the leg up in my career because you know from from that um the, you know, we went on to make Night Watch after Celebrate Me Home and having toured, you know, all over the place with Fleetwood Mac and that it was and uh, I, I yeah, it really kind of just just solidified my uh, loyalty to Kenny, too, because I I credit him with actually putting me on the map kind of, you know, first hit record I ever played on and all of that. I mean, you know, large national hit. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so. Well, the, the quality will out, though. I mean, I could see it in Jasbo. I saw it in Honk. And, you know, it's just natural that the cream rises to the top, in a sense. Um, I, you told me a story, I think, in the Jasbo oh. days. You had mm -hmm. mottos on your drum set. And you said that a studio musician drummer had told you about that. Was that Hal Blaine? Ah, oh, I had I, I had what? I'm sorry, on oh. my drum Bongo. Oh, bongos. Ah, ah. Pop. oh, you know, actually, I wanted to, uh, I bought a set back in the, uh, the Jasbo days of what are called concert toms. Yeah. And, and they were in the 70s. That was sort of like the thing. And, and one of the first drummers ever to use those were, were 
uh, was Hal Blaine. And he had a set of, of six of them. I mean, eight of them. It was actually a full octave. You could actually tune a full octave. And, but it included a six-inch tom-tom and an eight-inch tom-tom. And uh, a six is a real small target. <laughs> but it went all the way to, to you know, to 16-inch. And and uh, and so yeah, I had a full array kind of of toms, yeah. and uh, that was a pearl set, I believe, back then. They were fiberglass, and uh, it was such a the high poppiness of it. It's like a bit of bit of bit of, and it's just ah. really made the songs. Uh, oh man! Hey, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> I'm I'm going to run out of time. I know because I'm approaching the the ten minute marker, but I want oh. to get to your studio time session work. Uh, mm -hmm. After Kenny, you also went to Firefall and then Chicago, but you're doing tours with um, uh, Al Jarreau and Chaka Khan, and you're yeah. doing lots of other studio stuff. You mentioned uh, Ian Matthews. Um, mm -hmm. How did how did you do the balance between tour and studio? Well, yeah, that's I was I was fortunate that that uh, through the records I'd kind of. Uh, been known for with Kenny uh, there were producers who liked my style uh, because it used to be that uh, you know you, you a producer would start using you and and would use you with numerous different artists that they might be producing um, yeah, but if you leave town for any length of time they got to call somebody else so I was one of the fortunate few that got to do both tour and record with, with with a lot of different artists um and then through through actually my work with Kenny too I I met David Foster and and uh, uh there was a song called Heart to Heart that we did that he co-wrote and played on with Michael McDonald and all and uh he liked my playing and he started using me so uh, through him I worked with oh my god uh, everybody from Neil Diamond did a couple of albums with him and uh, actually the theme song on the last record I did with him was a, I played on the theme theme song or the title song uh, Best Years of Our Lives uh, it was a single I think too and did pretty well uh, and then you know David's own music uh, uh, the theme from uh, St. Elmo's Fire and that that was me on that and uh, I got, I even worked with uh, Stevie Wonder and uh, um, Julio Iglesias. They did a song that was a big hit together called My Love that Stevie Wonder had worked on. So uh, it was really cool. Uh, and I credit my work with Kenny uh, for, for a lot of that. That's kind of how producers got to know me, not just David, many others who have worked with a lot of different artists. First, uh, Celebrate Me Home, right? album right bob james producer. bob james right and phil ramon okay did you work with bob at all or yes the, the first album that i did with with kenny night watch okay. uh that was the original kenny loggins band with mike hamilton and and george and the two horn players and and, man. and, and brian mann right yeah high school yeah is that right you knew him from high school well oh. i but he went to Santa Ana with, I think, um, some of the Righteous Brothers guy guys went there. Oh. there there's a connection to Santa Ana High School. Uh, oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I knew his his, his folks had a, a home in uh, Laguna Beach, uh, and his dad, uh, Milton Man, was sort of the he had Milton or the. Yeah, Milton Man uh, Accordion Studios, which was a chain of studios, I guess, in Southern California or California. And uh, yeah, Brian was an amazing accordionist as well. <laughs> well, yeah. now I have to get into the big C word, cancer. When when did that, Where? what group were you in at the time when that affected you? Okay. Yeah, I was with with Chicago and I've been with them since 1990. I was asked to join the band, uh, which was in itself a huge honor because they could have asked any drummer and they would have said oh, yes. Any seraphim, so. Yeah, yeah. So 
I was very flattered and honored to be asked. And and uh, um, anyway, I'd been with the band since 1990. And <clears throat> around 2008, I'd gone in for an angio CAT scan and they discovered uh, uh, a mass. Actually, the angio CAT was to look at a little blockage that in, in the coronary artery that had been seen two out two years previously. So uh, they wanted to look at that again. And uh, the good news was, was that was had not progressed, but they found this mass and it's a good thing I'd gone in. The, the mass had been, it was about two years old. It was stage 3A squamous cell lung cancer. And uh, yeah, and so that's not early stage. <laughs> Well, I was terrified and, um, you know, I thought that was it. I thought, you know, I was a goner and uh, I sort of went around to, to different hospitals and doctors and, and to, to try to see where I felt best about being treated. I ended up in Vanderbilt and at, uh, in Nashville and they did a tremendous job. Anyway, I had... Two, I had first simultaneous uh, radiation and chemo to shrink the mass. And then they went in under my right arm and they they removed two thirds of my right lung because wow. you have three lobes on your right side and two on your left. So at present, I have one and a third <laughs> lobes. And uh, anyway, through surfing and through running, I was a, an avid runner and kind of a health nut, you know, uh, in the years leading up to that. It wasn't always a health nut, but... You all, right? <laughs> well, I ha I did, but I'd quit like 11 years before. Okay. And uh, and I'd started running. Uh, so um, anyway, I had this big lung capacity. Uh, you know, they tested me with spirometry and all that and uh, and uh, my doctor said, uh, you know, by the time I'm done with you, you should be about normal, knowing that he was going to have to take out, you know, virtually one lung. Uh, I had like 140 percent of normal or something lung capacity. So anyway, the good news for me was was after um, uh, them having done the lobectomy, as it's called, uh, I was uh, at about 90% of normal. Um, so I, uh, that was really fortunate. Yeah, good so, yeah, good trick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, Is, anyway. It, they cut it all out so there's there's no remission or if, issue? No. no, I have to go for yearly CAT scans to make sure. But my oncologist at Scripps Institute um like like four years ago said you know i think you're done i think i think it's gone i think you, you don't have to worry about it anymore we'll still do the yearly cat scan we have to yeah but so, but i think i think you're done so i am so grateful rick and uh, i'm so blessed i know i am and there is just no rhyme or reason as to who get who survives and who doesn't and and i i mean some of the healthiest people i've ever known in my life and strongest have been taken down by you know cancer and and i just was one of the lucky ones and particularly since it wasn't early stage you know so i i i really it's made me keenly aware of just what a gift life is and and every day is you know well, you wouldn't have met Mary. If yeah. <laughs> all that good stuff, man. No no yacht all-stars. No, uh, right. You wouldn't have been inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame like you were in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. My God, man. Oh, I've got to show you something. I still have it. The face mask that you signed at the coach house. Oh, Rick! Oh, that's great. <laughs> I don't wear it anymore because it's it's up there. Oh man, 
I'm very flattered, man, that you would hold on to that. It's <laughs> the only Rock and Roll Hall of Fame face mask that I have. I've <laughs> a friend, uh, oh, Leland Sklar back there. He's oh, my God. I love Leland. Yeah. Oh, man. You guys did something together. I can't remember what it was, but there's some album that we were both on. And yeah, there's actually been a few, but you know, it's it's so strange how how this business works. Uh, we've never actually recorded live at the same time with each other. Uh, we almost did a tour together uh, with a a French artist, uh, Veronique Sanson, and I was I was asked to to do it, but. Uh, but with Chicago's schedule, I just, I couldn't do it. And so, uh, but uh, I, I really wanted to. I think uh, Kurt Biscara ended up uh, doing the tour. But uh, but yeah, I love Leland. And man, what can you say about his playing? <laughs> oh, man. He just I finished mean, Miles' tour yesterday. He's arriving, he's arrived most likely by now back at home. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. Yeah, good for him. 70-day tour, 57 shows. He's time for a little rest. Good, good. I'm glad. He certainly earned it. Jesus. Now, that guy has been has played on more important records and will continue to <laughs> into God knows when, you know. And uh, You family group? I, I have not seen them yet. Uh, I really would love to see them. Russ Kunkel has long been one of my heroes too. And, and you've surfed uh, with him, right? And I'm sorry? You've surfed with him? We've talked about it. Wow. Hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Back before you moved to Florida, you guys were living fairly close to each other. Yeah, uh, well, we were, but but there again, you know, I'm it just, sure. yeah, just schedules. Uh, so, uh, but I would sure look forward to that time. I really look forward to that day. <laughs> well, he's on the tour too. He just finished with Lyle as well. So maybe you guys can get together. Yeah, that'd <laughs> be great. We'll surf yeah. Uh, yeah. Down to the last two minutes. Uh, I want to make sure that I get everything in here. Session work, my bottom one. Uh, the, oh, um, yeah, hair. Ah. You lost hair because of the chemo, right? Yeah. Yeah, although I was already blonde hair. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I was uh, sort of follicularly challenged, as they say, uh, <laughs> before that. Uh, but during a, during a period in the eighties, uh, you know, it's not news, I'm sure, to to many that uh, um, actually Kenny. Loggins in my absence when I left to go play with Al Jarreau. Um, uh, I came back and was dividing my time between Al and Kenny Loggins. And uh, some of the guys in the band had hair extensions and, and all of that at that time. It was sort of, you know, the thing to do. So Kenny, Kenny came to me and said, how would you feel about that? And I said, I'll never do that. I don't want to do that. And he said, well, how about if I pay for half of it? And I went, hmm. Let's see, what, which half? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that a comb over or what? <laughs> well, we're, so, we're the last minute, but I want to say that the, um, the hair may be gone, but the smile that's always been present is still there. Oh, oh Rick. That's what you're also known for is your optimism and your your great smile and your sense of vibrance of life. So um until the next time. Oh, oh man. great to see you. Man. Yeah.